Hello and welcome to the Quest on Rajya Sabha TV. I am Rakhi Bakshi. This is a show where we present to you insights into the life and career of a leading personality. His or her joys, sorrow, inspirations, influences, happiness, everything we present to you in this show. Uh, we would also like to tell you that in this show we give you a holistic view of that person's work, whether it's, it is in the field of uh, politics, sports, entertainment or social work, we give you a wholesome picture of that personality. So ladies and gentlemen, tonight the guest on our show is a man who is a politician, a lawyer, a playwright, a writer, also an educationist and wears many heads, hats with equal ease. Presenting to you Union Minister for External Affairs, Mr. Salman Khurshid. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you. Let's begin with your childhood days. Was it really a normal childhood? Your grandfather was former president of India, father, former governor. How was it like? Normal or different? Well, if you uh, think of it, I, I think it was quite normal. I've, uh, I spent my entire childhood and, and uh, young adulthood traveling by by buses like everybody else did in my school, my college. I, um, Jamia where I lived, uh, I played cricket in the streets like uh, many other many other young young boys did. But how did your surrounding allow you actually? There weren't, there, there wasn't any sense, there wasn't any sense of being, being uh, you know, uh, part of an elite, elite surroundings. There wasn't any issue of security. I didn't see a policeman guard my family uh, till, till uh, you know, I was much older. Um, and that too, when they came, they were more like family members than, than actually secret policemen that were guarding us. So uh, I had, yeah, I had a completely, completely uh, uh, normal life. Uh, in fact, uh, the only time I remember my, my, my grandfather was, uh, was president and I was a member of uh, the BPS NCC uh, Naval Cadets team. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was uh, not the top, I was at the, the second lineup. And the uh, our top leaders of both the Army, Navy, and the Air Force wings uh, were leading a parade, which uh, my school asked me if I could persuade my grandfather to come, and he came as president. Uh, and I was given that for the first time a little honor of being uh, the two cadet amongst the two cadets who were actually going to to lead the parade uh, in in the front. So that's the only little little. Uh, uh, sense of, of something different that I ever saw because people were so excited and they wanted uh, to see a picture of mine with my grandfather. But otherwise it was a completely normal life. I did everything that everyone else did. And if at all there were constraints on my childhood behavior, mm. it was because they made me a monitor very early on in life. And I went on to become head boy of DPS Matra Road. So You like to lead? Well, I enjoyed leading. Frankly, I did enjoy leading, but all the pranks that you play when you're young and uh, sometimes uh, stretch discipline a little bit was something that I was deprived of because uh, I was put in position of responsibility too early and that remained right through uh, till of course I went to college where life was suddenly very different. So you would say that shaped somehow, you know, those early seeds of leadership? Well I, well, I hope so. I mean, I hope so. I've, I had some, some friends uh, at that time who I felt were uh, perhaps more talented than I was and outstanding and some of them have now become army generals and some of them have become uh, you know, top top uh, people in, in movies, uh, making movies or they become outstanding writers. When I was in St. Stephen's College, uh, around the time that I was in St. Stephen's College, I tried my hand at writing and I wasn't very successful. But some of the top writers of the world have emerged from those three years in which I was in St. Stephen's College. Uh, people who Any influences, inspirations that you looked up to? Well, the inspiration, I see, I was, uh, uh, I thought a lot about public life and, and about public discourse. Uh, although I, we lived in a fairly, uh, you know, fairly uh, uh, aloof from, from the hurly-burly of the world and we lived in a fairly uh, compact, uh, close-knit family, I did think a lot about public life and public discourse, the great leaders of the world including in India. I mean, I was deeply impressed by Panditji, as many people in my generation were. And then, of course, much later I saw, I worked with Indraji. I had a chance to work with Indraji. Then we saw 
So, uh, late Rajiv ji, uh, and then of course, uh, the pantheon of leaders since then. And then on the, on the global stage, uh, you know, there was Ho Chi Minh, and there was Che Guevara, and there was, uh, and there was Mandela, there was Mandela, and, uh, and there was the Kennedys in, in the US, etc. So, there was a whole range of people that one admired enormously. And uh, one tried to read up about and, and, and collect pictures of as really icons and heroes of my growing years. Uh, and I thought, if I can be even a small percentage of what these people have been and how they've influenced the lives of other people, that would be great. Um, and that's why how then... Was, how was the period where you worked with Indiraji? Uh, you closely worked with her? Well, I was in Oxford when I was offered. And I was offered a uh, post with Indraji because uh, someone who had been very close to me in Oxford and I, with whom I spent many, many hours talking about what is happening here in India uh, was Arjun Sen Gupta. He was an economist. He was very close to Mrs. Gandhi. And he came up to work for Mrs. Gandhi while I was still at Oxford. And uh, Dr. Alexander was the principal mm -hmm. secretary at that time. And I think they put their heads together and they thought, uh, you know, why not get someone who's at Oxford to be part of the prime minister's office. And so I was summoned. And it was really too attractive to say no to. I was still teaching, teaching at Oxford. But it was so difficult to say no to, to uh, an invite, a direction, uh, an expectation from someone like uh, Indira Gandhi. So um, I succumbed to that temptation. I worked with her for a year though, but I think that uh, being in an Oxford uh, academic atmosphere where you have no constraints on what you do, say and how you behave and suddenly you come into this very, very, very sensitive office where every little, little uh, look on your face uh, is interpreted and everyone's always expecting you to be at the best behavior. After a year, I thought that uh, it was a fantastic opportunity and great honor, but I ought to get back uh, into real life and into, into uh, practice of law, which is what I had intended to do initially. And so I, I respectfully excused myself and I sought uh, permission to go back and start practicing, which is what I did for 10 years. There's so much more that we'll be talking about. Uh, we are talking to Mr. Salman Khurshid. And after his childhood days, after his study, after his uh, initial days, we are going to talk in the next segment about his career. We'll come back to you in after a short break. Welcome to the quest once again. We are talking to Mr. Salman Khushi, the Union Minister for External Affairs. But somebody, as I was telling you, is wearing many hats at the same time, many shades to his personalities, who is somebody who is alive to many new ideas also. We are talking now about his career, entering to politics. How did that happen actually? Well, I, I, I did tell you that I had this fascination about people in public life and about public discourse. And I read up a lot of autobiographies. I had fancied myself sometimes uh, in a revolutionary profile, sometimes uh, in a uh, uh, profile of a statesman, sometimes in a profile, profile of a, a street worker, uh, sometimes um, looking at the image of, of uh, a remarkable leader like Mahatma Gandhi and the, the, the feel that Mahatma Gandhi had uh, to reach ordinary people and inspire them. So they were, there was a jumble of, of impressions that I had in my mind. And uh, I knew that somewhere uh, my, my personality uh, would want uh, a touch of politics. But I didn't know how I would do it. I was too serious about what I was doing at college, playing cricket or, or doing uh, serious academic work. When I was at Oxford, I worked really hard, really, really hard. I've never worked like that in my life. I worked really hard. And I enjoyed it thoroughly. The intellectual challenges were absolutely, absolutely fantastic. So I didn't actually get into student politics, except for fighting one election in St. Stephen's College, which I lost. And I fought that, not because I had prepared myself for that election, but because my very good friend Rajiv Narotra, who is again uh, in today a media icon, he uh, decided not to contest an election that he prepared for, for almost a year. And I was his main supporter. So when he decided to withdraw, I jumped in and I fought and I lost. Uh, and that was my, my first defeat. But, you know, defeats teach you a lot of things. Then uh, uh, I just waited for the right opportunity. And then 
I must say that for me, it just came like a uh, like heavenly manner. One morning, I was in court and I was I was told that uh, Mr. Rajiv Gandhi wanted to see me, uh, and so I didn't want to go in my court clothes. I wanted to go in something something that looked more uh, uh, more like uh, in you know uh, respectable in public life. And I couldn't find clothes that I could wear, uh, so I borrowed my father's shirt. And I discovered after meeting Mr. Rajiv Gandhi that I had a, a a pocket missing in that shirt because it was a, a, a shirt that obviously for some reason the pocket had got ripped off. But I met him and he offered that I should fight for Rukhabad. Uh, my father had uh, recently been appointed governor and the seat was available and he offered that seat to me. And uh, this happened before anybody else was announced as a candidate. And so I knew I was the candidate, but I couldn't tell the world that I was a candidate. And I went back to court uh, with this, this strange feeling of, uh, you know, I now have to move on to something else. I have to say goodbye to all this that I have loved so much. But that was it. And then before I knew I was fighting the election, I fought the election, I was doing well in it. And suddenly uh, the Shilanyas happened and all our votes disappeared. I lost by 6,000 votes. And I was shattered, completely shattered. I went and saw him and uh, Rajivji said, uh, you know, 6,000 is nothing, nothing. Just don't give up. Just don't give up. And uh, I didn't. 18 months later, I had a chance again. Sadly, he wasn't around. He passed away two days before he was to come to Farukhabad. So I was knocked down completely. I mean, I was shattered, as, as were so many people. But then elections did happen, and I, I won that election. And uh, so we saw we saw a person who mixed his urban experience with the practical rural approach. How did that mix happen to you? I didn't find it too difficult. I mean, frankly, I've uh, I think I must have evolved gradually. I've become more comfortable in rural surroundings, but I was no never uncomfortable. Uh, it may be that I first went to campaign for my father. I was in blue jeans and a T-shirt. Uh, when I went to campaign for myself, I was awkwardly in Kurta Pajama. Uh, but uh, since then, I think uh, I have become comfortable with how people are and people have become comfortable with how I am. So I sometimes wear a tracksuit, sometimes I wear a Kurta Pajama, sometimes I wear a jacket, sometimes I wear something else. And uh, I'm really, really uh, uh, thankful to my people in Farukhabad who accepted me for what I am. They've given me a lot of affection, support, sometimes a lot of pain as well. But uh, I think we've got along well. Why do you say pain? I mean, that well, it has been. It's uh, it's not easy to it's not easy to to pursue a career in politics because the expectations that people have, and not everybody is your is sympathetic to you. Uh, but in terms of demand, everybody has. When a you demand. say that, can I ask you that sometimes uh, truth gets hurt? Do you think sometimes one voice, and I'm talking about sir? certain controversy also which happened. Yeah, of course. Do you think one side gets a better voice or dominating voice and the other side gets uh, suppressed somewhere? No, no, of course, of course. There is, uh, uh, there is, uh, there is a lot in public life and politics uh, that, uh, that can be extremely excruciating, hurtful and something that can destroy you uh, totally. And it takes, it takes years for the truth, truth finally to, to emerge. And I've, uh, I've had my share of, of uh, controversies. I've had things that people feel have uh, been said at the wrong time in the wrong place. But frankly, uh, and you know, today, of course, everything gets viral before you know. Uh, everybody's talking about it, and then it's being multiplied uh, 10 times, etc., and so on. And before you know, you're in a kadgara, you're, uh, you're in a confined place trying to, to fend off attacks on you, etc. But I'm glad that I can say that I've never... How has it made a difference to you, if I may ask? Well, it does harden you. It makes you tougher. First time it happens, uh, you know, you, you feel that, uh, uh, that it's the end of the world. But as, in fact, a, def a defeat in an election. First time it happens, you think it's the end of the world. You just don't know. I was a minister for six, for five years, and then uh, we were wiped out. UP got zero seats. We were wiped out. I was, I was wiped out. Um, and it just seemed like the end of the world.
till I discovered that it, it is not the end of the world, and I discovered that there is a life besides uh, electoral politics. And uh, I, must, uh, I must acknowledge uh, with gratitude what my leadership, with what uh, Sonia ji has, uh, has meant to me in my career uh, at critical moments to have picked me up and sent me to UP as president uh, of the UPCC. Uh, I never expected it. Um, then having picked me to do that a second time, uh, picked me to be a general secretary of the Congress, uh, and then, frankly, uh, the positions that I hold today. Exactly. So many minis key ministries that uh, you have handled. So, so, I mean, who do I thank for this? Uh, the, the Prime Minister and, and Congress President. They are our two leaders. And uh, it m might, must not have been easy all the time. There are so many claims and, and so many people and, 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 and so many contradictions, etc. And I must say that that's, that certainly made it, made it uh, worth the while. But at the same time, I, I think that one's learned uh, lessons. And if you were to ask me, uh, would you do the same thing all over again? Uh, I think the test lies in my saying, yes, I will not change. Uh, but of course, if you, in hindsight, uh, prepare yourself better for the kind of opposition that you will receive, then you would prepare yourself better. But I, wouldn't, I don't think that there is anything that I have done I would not do if I was given a chance to do it again. Since you've seen so much and uh, you talked about Sonia Ji, now Rahul Gandhi is in the picture and in focus and they say that one day, very shortly, he would lead the nation also. How, what are your views about it? See, I don't, uh, I don't want to articulate anything that Mr. Rahul Gandhi is not himself articulating. Uh, we have as a party, as a party, we have very clearly given our full support, uh, I will go even further, the party has given adoration and adulation to him. Uh, and I think that it's very, very, very clear that he holds the key to a lot that is going to happen in this country in the future. But the specific articulation of how he wants to do it, uh, in which manner, in which way he wants to, to, to announce it, to pronounce it, uh, I would rather, uh, if we accept, accept him as a leader, then we should leave it to him. Uh, and if he wants any one of us at any time to do it uh, on his behalf, then he will tell us. So I don't think that we should really uh, make things difficult for him in terms of the life plan that he has by interjecting and, and uh, intruding and adding something that, frankly, we shouldn't. We should just do the jobs that we are we have been asked to do. How hopeful do them about, well. are you about UP politics or UP as such? I will never give up on UP. I've had very tough experiences in UP, but I've also had rewards in UP. When I went the first time, we were zero seats. Uh, we got up to nine seats in Parliament. Um, when we were fighting uh, a very very dismal battle uh, last time, uh, everybody thought. We didn't deserve more than 10 seats even to fight. Uh, we actually won the largest number of seats, which was 22. Uh, not entirely a rosy picture throughout because assemblies, we don't do that well. Parliament, we do much better. But I have, uh, uh, I just think that yes, there are, there are ways in which and, and, and a moment will come that uh, we will be able to claw back much of the space that we have lost in UP. And we must, and we must, in our own lifetime, we must. So we are talking to Mr. Salman Khurshid, a person who is always alive and, as we are saying, is always ready with new ideas. We'll be talking about something interesting and some interesting tidbits about his life and career just after this short break. Once again. Welcome to the show once again. Now we are talking to Mr. Salman Khurshid. Let's hear from him only. The challenges as an external affairs minister recently, of course, the Sri Lankan issue that, of course, you'd like to also talk about because... Uh, it, it, it does get gets hot up and today itself in Parliament you spoke about it. Uh, how, how sensitive it is and how you basically... Well, you don't come to, to foreign office to sing songs and, and, uh, and play music, uh, although that's part of cultural diplomacy and I think that one shouldn't uh, undermine that. But uh, uh, foreign office is a tough job. Uh, external affairs is not an easy job. It's a tough job. Uh, you have to, and this is not a time where you can push people around and you can show a lot of muscle. I think your persuasive, your persuasive capacity and to use diplomacy to its true, true effect 
is the big challenge that the external affairs ministry offers whether it's in the neighborhood or the extended neighborhood or for that matter in the vast world africa latin america uh, asia asia uh, europe etc um, i think uh, it is a very challenging job and uh, we're talking about sri lanka well sri lanka is also tough it's tough because it's not just simply what we think uh, should happen in sri lanka but it's also what uh, what people in our country who who identify very strongly with the uh, tamils in sri lanka feel should happen in sri lanka so it is a very complicated a very sensitive and a delic- delicate subject and we have to find the right balance you can't be on either extreme and at the end of the day india has to learn to live with its neighbors uh, like pakistan for example pakistan bhutan bangladesh maldives uh, sri lanka uh, everybody i no, mean everybody as, uh, as far has as pakistan is concerned you said that foundation of peace constituencies have to be created well i see i uh, uh, I'm a little saddened by people who, who seem to think that war is an option. Uh, I think they need to read their history more carefully. While you cannot uh, escape the thought of war and you have to be ready in case war is, in, is, is imposed on you, uh, I think history tells us that there is much more to be gained from peace than there is to be gained from war. And in the world of today and, and the, the kind of... A, kind of balance there is in the world of today i think it's it's very very myopic to be thinking of finding uh, war solutions to the kind of problems that we face despite all the aggravations the provocations and the hurt that we have felt i have conviction that peace can prevail and will prevail and i'm very pleased to know that on the other side in pakistan the peace constituency is growing we've always had a strong peace constituency but that it's growing in pakistan i think is a very encouraging i thought and maldives of course you have expressed a lot of hope uh, about the elections see maldives uh, maldives is an issue uh, which has to be solved by maldivians uh, we can be of help but at the end of the day you can't dictate to any country uh, you can't interfere in another country but to the extent it's possible as friends and as as participants in a common goal uh, that you can be of help to anyone then you would and that's what we did uh, we can't take sides we cannot dictate we can perhaps uh, suggest we can perhaps persuade but we can certainly cannot dictate i think that's no question and people sitting in their own little uh, rooms in india think that we can dictate to a country because it's small completely unacceptable we size is not going to dictate uh, uh, dictate how we behave and how we conduct ourselves we are equal we are equal partners in the enterprise of of peace prosperity and growth in our region and therefore we must show respect for each other uh, and not not force respect of each other but have genuine respect for each other and you think uh, that is also true in the cases of let's say united states of america and uh, united kingdom because british prime minister just came and usa we have the second term of mr barack obama well you know that most indians uh, when uh, when uh, president obama won his first election most indians felt that they had uh, they had uh, in absentia voted for him uh, they saw him as an extension as it were of india's perception of of how america should be Uh, there were disappointments because you know he is president of america not president of india and he has to serve the people of america first but uh, i think that there is there is uh, much much that uh, uh, that is possible between the us and india uh, we are strategic partners today there was a time when we were we were we were referred to as the estranged democracies but today we are strategic partners so the world has is changed and our relationship has changed as far as england is concerned uh, the uk is concerned uh, uh, the prime minister's visit here was an excellent visit i thought that he made a very very special effort to reach out to india to our prime minister and i think that he had a very successful visit we've had a traditionally a very strong relationship with the uk but the constituencies in uk demographic constituencies are changing in uk and we know that some of their some of their political uh, groups have had to veer towards pakistan because there are a lot of mirpuris and pakistanis uh, people of pakistani origin that dominate their constituencies 
but we have our people as well, uh, Indian people as well. But ultimately, I think uh, it is our moral standing as, as, as a country and also the, the attraction of our market. Uh, these are the two things that we have to combine for a compelling foreign policy. And I believe that we have that, we have that formula. And I do believe that uh, we will succeed with that formula. We are just coming to the end of the show, but uh, I would like to talk to you or ask you about the dream that you have, the hopes and the dream and the road that you want to travel on. The road I, I know, but it's a rough road ahead because uh, it passes through Farukhabad and it passes through UP. Uh, and we have uh, a year down the road, we have an election to face. And we do know that it's not going to be easy. It's going to be tough. There's a lot of hard work to do. Uh, a lot of people to persuade and I hope that our record and what I am able to do for the country does contribute to people's assessment of what they want me to do. But I, uh, uh, what I would like to see is, what I would like to see is the vision we have of an extremely, extremely successful and prosperous India. I went to Bhutan recently and Bhutan have this idea of a gross, gross uh, national happiness that they, they have. I wish we could apply that in India as well. I wish uh, we can add a little bit to the uh, sense of, of, of happiness of our people. Uh, I would consider that, that a dream. Uh, and I hope that this is a dream that gets fulfilled one day. We can't do it in our generation. Perhaps the next generation will do it. Thank you so much indeed for spending so much time for us. Thank you very and much. And we we'll look you. forward to so much more that you're going to do. And happiness is the key, as Mr. Salman Khushid says. And happiness is something that we all also look forward to. Uh, a happy ending to this show, The Quest. I hope that you also like to be happy watching this show. Goodbye and good night.